Hello, this is my honor to be the first presenter of this StepConf21. Before I start, I'd like to thank all the people from the video team. Let me quickly explain who I am once more. So I'm Thomas. I'm a DD since 2010. I'm the OpenStack Packager in Debian since 2011. I've been doing hosting since 2001 or two, something like that. I currently work for Infomaniac since 2018. And at Infomaniac, I've built multiple large Swift clusters, multiple compute clouds. Uh, we just uh, about to release a public cloud for a new customer. And everything I've been doing in OpenStack, we shipped it in Debian. Also, I'm very happy that Infomaniac is sponsoring DebConf since 2019. I'm also very happy to announce that once more, Infomaniac is sponsoring the DebConf this year. So, what are we going to talk about today? First of all, I'm going to give you a quick update on OpenStack in Bullseye. I'm going to quickly uh rehash what i've been saying in taiwan and then in brazil then i'll give you a, an update on oci itself for those who don't know openstack is the biggest cloud as in infrastructure as a service it means that you just take a bunch of computer together and on it you are able through an api to spawn virtual machines it's written fully in Python and it's composed of multiple services. Uh, the one responsible for compute, starting VMs, block storage, one responsible for block storage, which is called Cinder. Another service called Swift is responsible for object store. Neutron takes care of networking and so on and so on. Sometimes OpenStack feels a little bit like this, like uh, not so easy and the result is probably not what we would expect from uh, a big shoot. What's new about OpenStack in Bullseye? First of all, a few project has retired. Some are all available in Debian, some have never been in Debian at all. That's the case, for example, for Searchlight which was deprecated a few months ago. Murano, there is currently talks about deprecating it. Neutron Firewall as a service uh, has stopped its development because the security group provides in and out firewall. Penko is set to stop uh, development as well. Chingling, which is the equivalent of what you find as Lambda in AWS has stopped a year ago. Though not everything is dark and some new projects popped up. For example, we have Adjutant, which takes care of registration through the web interface uh, Horizon. It has a plugin for it. Now, this is not yet in Debian, but that's kind of new. F Freezer uh, that does backup and restore is in Bullseye as well. And Mazakari is not in Bullseye, but it's already in Bookworm. Also, there's the new concept of placement, which is a new OpenStack project. It's taking care of accounting resources and deciding where to, to schedule them. As you may know, there is an OpenStack release every six months. And therefore, we package a new version of OpenStack every six months. This is not aligned with the Debian release cycle. And therefore, we have every repository available through XREPO. For example, if you want to uh, enable OpenStack Victor Victoria, which is in Bullseye, Victoria is the OpenStack release in Bullseye, you can do XREPO enable OpenStack Victoria. What it's going to do is take everything that is in Bullseye and on top of it add a few updates. Uh, these updates, I'm trying to push them as much as I can in Bullseye itself. Though through XREPO, I'm able to do these updates way faster than it would take. If you wish to use OpenStack Wallaby 
on top of Bullseye, you just do extra pull enable OpenStack Wallaby. Thanks a lot to Wouter for inventing extra pull and maintaining it. Overall, I'm convinced that OpenStack Victoria, as in Bullseye, is the best release of OpenStack that I ever made in Debian. Why that? It's because thanks to putting everything in production at Infomaniac, uh, we've, we did a lot of testing in real production. The Infomaniac cloud is using Bullseye plus Victoria, as you may find it in the official repository. As you know, the freeze of Bullseye was really, really long. And thanks to the release team, I've been able to do all the updates I, w I wanted to happen before the re final release. So I'd like here to thank a lot the release team for all the patience and the help they've provided. So after this quick recap of things in Bullseye, I'd like to come back to the last two talks I've done for DebConf. The first one was in Taiwan and the other one was in Brazil. The talk I did in Taiwan was a reaction to what the FSF uh, has said. The FSF pretended that there is no such cloud, there is only other people's computer. That's an idea I've been f fighting for many years already. Uh, the thing is, what motivates me to do the OpenStack packaging and working on OpenStack is to fight proprietary clouds. OpenStack is an alternative to running on AWS, Google, or Azure. As in, you can build your own infrastructure on premise in your own data center, in your garage, or whatever. Which is why I did a talk called Server Freedom, Why Choosing the Cloud, OpenStack, and Debian. Over the years, the cloud has become a very important uh, thing for everyone and the preferred way to deploy the workloads for the enterprises. Instead of fearing that technology, we should embrace it and use it. Though it's still important to use free software, it must be reproducible on premise. Then I'm claiming that the best cloud is OpenStack because it's free, free of vendor lock-in. And I believe that the best OpenStack is on Debian, especially on Bullseye. I gave myself um, the mission to make it easy to use because OpenStack is hard to deploy. So I've tried to make it easier for Debian users to deploy and use OpenStack. The first thing that I made to make it easier to use is writing DebConf helpers. So just by answering DebConf questions, you can install a working OpenStack. The second thing that I did was contributing to Puppet OpenStack upstream so that it would work for Debian and, and then an administrator can use Puppet OpenStack for his deployment. And then the final work is glue all of that, like the OpenStack packages and my work on Puppet OpenStack, so that we can set it up with an easy to use software. And that's what OpenStack cluster installer is about. OCI is an alternative to Fuel, uh, somehow to OpenStack and Sybil, Triple O, and other commercial software from big vendors like Red Hat, Mirantis, and so on. If you didn't see the previous presentation in Taiwan or in Brazil, I'm going to click quickly let you know what OCI is. So OCI is a bunch of scripts, so like 50% PHP, 25% shell script, and 25% Puppet. Your new servers will boot on a Debian Live system that has been built using Live Build. Once booted, the live distribution will do hardware discovery and report it to the central PXE server. Once the hardware has been reported to the central API, it's possible to install the systems directly from the live distribution. Then the server reboots on a freshly installed system and the server has been set up so that Puppet is ready to be used and configure the servers depending on its role. So what happened since the last presentation I did in Brazil? Well, kind of a lot, 
Uh, first of all, we did so many Puppet OpenStack upstream contribution so that it would even better support Debian. And we contributed a lot of patches so that it would better handle production. We gave up on the web interface because we've been using the CLI a lot and it didn't find relevant to continue working on that web interface. The OCI is generally more mature. It has more networking options, hardware support and features. I'm going to go through a few of them. So why no web interface? Well, over the years, I found out that CLI is a way more efficient and it's scriptable. I had no time to maintain a comfortable web GUI. And if we were to do a web GUI again, probably it would need to be rewritten from scratch. The OpenStack packages are pre-configured to use UWSGI as the web server for the OpenStack API. UWSGI or UWSGI is very nice because it performs very well. However, Puppet OpenStack didn't have support for it. This has been contributed and is available in Bullseye. You have a new Puppet provider called whatever you whiskey underscore config that helps you to configure any value of the you whiskey configuration file. More generally, we've been contributing patches to Puppet OpenStack driven by things that happen in production for Informaniac. I've tried to push Debian as a supported platform for the upstream Puppet OpenStack CI, though unfortunately this is not a, still not a thing. Also, it's still very sad that Bullseye is still shipped with Puppet 5. We've worked on having Puppet 6 package for Bullseye, but it didn't happen. If you want to know more and want to contribute to have Puppet 6 in Debian, please join the Puppet packaging buff later this week. I can say that OCI is production ready since We've been using it in production for a few years already. At Infomaniac, we have services using Swift, so we have four clusters in production. This accounts for more than 250 servers, probably even more than 4,600 spinning drives the last time I counted. OCI has been used to deploy five compute clouds, one of them being a public cloud. The best proof I can give you that OCI is working is because DebConf is hosted at Informaniac Public Cloud. That public cloud has been set up with OCI and hopefully you can hear me. So hopefully it works. Saying that is kind of a bet because I'm the first presenter of DebConf this year. One feature which I believe is important that has been contributed to OpenStack is being able to run with a kind of BGP to the host setup. What's the concept behind BGP to the host networking? When you boot up a server, you have IPv6 link local address on each network interface. Then a BGP session is established between the host and its neighboring switches over that IPv6 local link. The servers then announce their IPv4 addresses over this BGP link. Why would you do BGP to the host? Well, if you're running a large cluster that spawns over multiple racks, and this creates a huge ARP spawning tree. Any switch can cause an, an ARP table reset on the top of the rack switches. Huge L2 networks, they don't scale, but BGP to the host does scale. So that's why we use it. Here is a quick image of what it looks like. Uh, I took it from Vincent Bernard. I hope he's fine that I took his image. <laughs> and so what you see is every computer is connected to a switch on his rack. In fact, to two switches. These create a map of routes between servers that can take multiple paths. In fact, that's why it's called ECMP for Equal Cost Multipath. So the cost of going from one server to another is the same for multiple routes. OCI handles 
BGP to the host. But the problem is that OpenStack does not. In fact, at some point, you always need servers to be L2 connected. This can be limited to only the network nodes. That's why there is the possibility to disable uh, distributed virtual routers. So in, in a BGP to the host setup, you would set up all of your deployment using BGP to the host. Only your network node would be L2 connected to the switches. And then you will disable DVR. Though there's also another mode of networking, which is kind of a BGP to the rack. So you will L2 connect all of your hosts to the switches, and then the switches will accept BGP announce using Neutron Dynamic Routing. Here's a picture about such a setup. As you may see, the I public IP addresses can go from one rack to another. As you may see, the public IPs of the virtual machines are announced through a transport network. That's the red one on the picture or the dark green on the left rack. Public IPs of the VM can effectively move from one rack to another and then they will be announced through BGP. This works very well, though it doesn't support IP address for the virtual router's gateways. Apart from networking, there's more hardware support that has been added in OCI. A problem we faced with New Worker Handle is that UDEV isn't ordering hard drives in a predictable way anymore. The issue is the kernel is still displaying old names like SD, A, B, C, etc. on the logging when there is some errors. Puppet OpenStack itself is kind of bound to the, the names and cannot really use UUID directly. The way we worked around the problem is creating and maintaining a slash dev slash disk folder containing symlinks to the currently used disk name through what it should be according to the hardware. So this is a UDEV rule for ordering that is maintained through OCI block device UDEV sorting script. That script receives a dev path variable which is passed and used to create the symlinks in the folder. That script uses vendor-specific tools like Megacli, Perkcli, SSA, CLI. And thanks to these tools, we're able to say where physically a device is connected. For example, if you have a two U servers with hard drives in front, then the first drive, we may call it SDA, and this is how the link will be called in the OCI sort folder. Over the last two years, we've been able to add fully auto hand-free automation so that you can just rack a server, power up the, that server, and wait, and it's simply set up. Without any manual interaction, you may have firmware upgrade, automatic detection where your server is, thanks to an LDP, OCI can apply RAID profiles, it can automatically add new nodes to the cluster. It can set up DNS and monitoring, install the system, reboot it, and set it to production. I did a longer presentation about this on the last OpenStack Summit last year. If you want to see the presentation, please just follow the link below. OCI is capable of installing your servers from zero to finish in just one go without any interaction from your side. The point is to have any manual setup because that's too much work. It's prone to error and it's taking too much of your time. Manual work is very repetitive and boring. So the solution is to have a fully automated hand-free install. This starts by auto-racking capabilities. OCI calls auto-racking is the possibility to discover where a server is physically located depending on the LLDP answers from the neighboring switches. This is defined in autoracking.json file, which contains the switch hostnames, 
the correspondence to the data center, the row and the rack where it's physically located. Once the auto racking is defined, the administrator can configure hardware profiles. Hardware profiles are defined in the JSON file containing the name of the profile. As you can see here, it's compute with var lib nova instance. It contains role, product name, as in your server name, how much memory you have, and the hard, hard drive layout. Once everything is set up, OCI will process the workflow as follow. First, it's going to do the IPME setup, change the IP address depending on what you've configured. It's going, then OCI will do the firmware upgrade of your server, depending the way you've configured it with a JSON file as well. Once that's done, the RAID profile will be applied to your server. Depending on the LLDP answers from your neighboring switches, OCI will guess where your server is located. According to the hardware profile and the role it matches, the server will be automatically added to the, to the cluster. If you configured a DNS plugin, OCI will automatically add the newly created hostname to your DNS. Then the operating system will be installed and the server will be rebooted under the production operating system. Once the server has rebooted in the production operating system and told so to OCI, the root password is going to be set. If you have a plugin for root passwords, this can be automatically saved in a vault, for example, HashiCorp vault. Then Puppet scripts will be applied, and if successful, OCI will call your monitoring scripts, which is going to add your server into the, your monitoring environment. Doing all of that, OCI provides a fully hand-free automation process. To tell the truth, what we do in production is we have all of what you see on screen fully automated. The only thing that we do manually is the install OS part that we just do with a single command. We prefer to check if the server is running well without any hardware issue. Another thing that's nice with OCI is that it, there is full SSL everywhere. Not only from the user's point of view, but also from the administrator point of view. Of course, you're not supposed to have the management network exposed to the outside. However, it's always best to make sure that everything is SSL encrypted. So the API endpoint is over SSL, but it also re-encrypts any connection to the VIP to the different API demons that OpenStack is comp composed of. Any process requiring a rabbit connection will do so over SSL as well. Whenever the services don't implement it, Directly, they just bind to localhost and then HAProxy does the SSL termination. This is the case, for example, for the metadata agent that Neutron is providing and that is set up on every compute nodes. Neutron metadata agent connects locally on a non-SSL connection, which redirects to the Nova metadata API. Another nice feature that we like a lot at Infomaniac is that it's possible to use an external Swift. What's that mean? Let's say you have already a cluster running Swift with a lot of storage space. Probably you do not want to set up Swift a second time on your newly installed cluster. That's what this feature is about. So you can connect cluster A, which is, for example, a compute cluster, to cluster B, which is a Swift cluster. Doing so, Glance and Cinder Backup will use Swift as a backend. One of the advantages is that you can mix topologies in your clusters. For example, the compute cluster can be fully located in one single data center, while the Swift cluster, which your compute cluster will connect to, may spawn over two data centers. The other advantage, which, uh, which I already mentioned, is that this way, you do not need to deploy Swift many times, just once for just Swift and a compute cluster that will connect to it. We also have improved Cinder LVM. Whenever you need to migrate a volume from Cinder, it may take a lot of bandwidth, so much that it could reduce the availability of the production block storage that Cinder is providing. Luckily, Cinder has an option for quality of service. This means that whenever you are doing a migration, 
Cinder is going to slow down the speed at which it is going to copy the block storage from one LVM node to another. Another feature that has been added is multi-back end. Let's say you have a Cinder volume that has six hard drives spinning disks. Then you want to connect your Elasticsearch to it. Elasticsearch knows already how to handle redundancy and hard drives. So in that case, probably you do not want to use RAID system for your LVM Cinder nodes. In such an environment, it, it'd be nice if Elasticsearch were able to connect to each of the drives of your Cinder LVM node. And that's what the multi backend option of OCI is doing. Every hard drive will be exposed alone as a Cinder type. For example, you can call it LVM SDA, LVM SDB, and so on. And then Elasticsearch, in our case, is able to, to select hard drives from one availability zone and select which SDA, SDB, or SDC that it wants to use as a backend. OCI now has GPU support. Currently, it can only handle one GPU per compute node. However, it can support any type of GPU in a cluster and you can mix the GPUs in your clusters. What you would do in that case is just tell OCI, which is the nice name of your GPU, which is the LSPCI vendor ID and the product ID. You define the Nova type type PF and a VFIO ID list. That's all you got to do and then you just define Nova flavors with GPU. Then magically, your Nova API will be set up correctly. Also, uh, the Nova compute on your compute nodes holding a GPU. OCI can also support CPU models. So what are CPU models? Whenever you spawn a VM with QMU, it's possible to define CPU models that your host CPU can handle. The reason to do that is that you want to expose some CPU flags to your instances, but maybe not all of them. The advantage when you just filter which CPU flags you expose to the virtual machines is that this way you are able to live migrate VMs between compute nodes even if they have different CPU models. With OCI, you can define a global CPU model for the whole of your cluster, or you may define a CPU model on each compute node. By default, OCI will set up every compute node as CPU pass-through. This means that by default, it's going to use the CPU flags of your hosts. Another thing you can do with compute hosts is you can set it up as Ceph OSD. It means that it's going to be a hyper-converged model where every single node will provide both storage and virtualization. DHCP servers are set up by default on the network nodes. However, you may want in some cases to scale it up, having more nodes handling the DHCP feature of OpenStack. In such a case, you just ask OCI to set up DHCP server on any of the compute nodes of your choosing. The same way it's possible to set up Neutron dynamic routing agents on any compute nodes as well as on any network nodes. There's a few other options that are available for any compute nodes. With Nova, it's possible to configure the amount of RAM or disk space that you reserve for the operating system and that will not be allocated to your virtual machines. This and the overcommitting flags are possible to be set with OCI on a per node basis. One of my colleagues added FileBit support to OCI. With just a few OCI CLI commands, you can configure your cluster so that every machine sends all the OpenStack logs to an Elasticsearch cluster. OCI now fully supports the telemetry project of OpenStack. So what is telemetry? It's the project in OpenStack that support metrics for your cluster. This includes Cellometer, Gnocchi, AODH. Thanks to telemetry and heat, you can do auto-scaling. This means spawning more VMs, for example, when you receive many carries to your load balancer. Here's a quick overview of the telemetry project. So the notification burst that you see on green above 
is in fact a RabbitMQ cluster. Each of the OpenStack API components can send notification through that bus. Cellometer also do, does some polling of the APIs like compute and images and storage to know how many resources you've used. Then Cellometer notification agent picks up every messages on that notification bus and then sends all the metrics to Gnocchi. That's the publishing pipeline that you see in blue below. Gnocchi is a time series database. Once the telemetry project is deployed, then it's possible to add CloudKitty. CloudKitty will read the metrics and do rating on top of it. Rating is counting the resources and tell how much it costs. CloudKitty has an API to configure prices of your deployment for every resources. For example, you can say that instance flavor in Nova Compute is that price and using 10 gig of object storage costs that much. Finally, it aggregates all of that and gives you the final price for the, the current month. The thing is, setting up telemetry on CloudKitty takes a lot of load. Just imagine that you have 6,000 VMs. Each of them would produce 20 metrics every five minutes. That's 400 metrics per second. So CloudKitty does rating. Rating is not billing yet. Rating is just accounting the cost of every resources of your cloud for a given project. CloudKitty can rate any resources of your deployment, like really any of it. It's kind of resource demanding and one needs to plan how to scale it. Because telemetry and CloudKitty requires a lot of CPU power, there is the possibility to deploy specialized nodes for all the billing system. So with OCI, you can deploy nodes of the role messaging. On these nodes, there is CloudKitty processor running, Gnocchi API, a specialized RabbitMQ notification bus, which is separated from the control plane, and a Galera cluster just for Gnocchi and CloudKitty. OCI supports only Gnocchi uh, as a storage and only Gnocchi using Ceph and MySQL as a backend. Therefore, it's possible to deploy a Ceph cluster dedicated to Gnocchi itself. Instead of believing me, you can just try Alphomaniac Public Cloud. We have uh, an offer of 300 USD of credits that you can use for how long you want. That's enough for running a virtual machines for a whole year. So just try it. So. Last, what's the future of OCI? So I'm planning to add a lot of new services like Magnum, Designate, Trove, Bistro, Manila, probably in that order. Some of the integration work has been done for supporting these projects. Before finishing this presentation, I'd like to thank uh, Mitchell uh, Arbet for his contribution to the OpenStack packaging. I'd like also to thank everyone from the blue team at, Open, at Infomaniac. The blue team at Infomaniac is the one taking care of clouds. Also, thanks to the release team for so many unblocks during the bullseye freeze and thanks to the FTP team for approving so many packages. I know both are a lot of peer reviewing work. Generally speaking, the stream people from OpenStack are awesome and very nice to uh, interact with. So thanks a, a lot to all of them for being such nice persons. If you want to get in touch, feel free to join IRC on the Debian OpenStack channel. You can also drop us a mail at debian-openstack at list.debian.org. Also, hopefully, at the next DebConf, we'll see each other in real. Because, you know, uh, yes, DebConf Online is fine. It's, it's, it's okay because we have no other ways, but it makes me miss all of you even more. That's all I have. Let's go for question and answers. And now we have some questions for Thomas Sego-Gorian. 
I'm not sure if right. you pronounce that right. Uh, the first question is, fast track is a thing now. Don't you want to add OpenStack star there too? So the thing is, uh, fast track is helpful for things that are hard to upload to Debian because there's many dependencies and so on. And that's not the problem with OpenStack. The problem with OpenStack is that there is one release every six months, which is not aligned with uh, the way Debian is released. So in that case, I would very much prefer if we had bike sheds or the equivalent of Ubuntu PPA or something. All right. And the second question is, can OpenStack run on a single machine? Does it make sense, for example, compared to Proxmox? Uh, so yes, you can set up OpenStack on a single node. Uh, does it make sense? I'm not really sure. So like the point is to have a bunch of computers that you can uh, set up together so that you can use them through an API. If you don't need to do that, I don't know, maybe Zen makes more sense in a single node. All right. And the first really depends. So uh, another thing is uh, on in, in Debian, there is also the OpenStack cluster installer POC package, as in POC, proof of concept. In there, you have uh, all of OCI, which is virtualized. I, I use that for my uh, development, meaning that um, it pops a bunch of virtual machines on your system where OpenStack is installed there the way you would do with um, physical servers. Of course, it takes a lot of memory. I, I personally, uh, uh, so we run it with half a terabyte of RAM so that we have a full setup just like the public cloud. You don't need that much. It would probably work with half of that. But like, uh, at least for the controllers, you need 64 gigs of RAM. And, and in that kind of environment, then yeah, maybe on a single node, but that's for just a proof of concept and, and, and try OpenStack, not really for production use. All right. And the third question is, is I as still relevant as the trend seems to pivot to Kubernetes? Uh, so the thing is, uh, Kubernetes and OpenStack are not opposing each other. What we do a lot inside my company is that we in the cloud team are responsible for OpenStack and many teams use OpenStack to set up Kubernetes on top. So uh, I believe they use Kubespray a lot to do that, that type of setup. Uh, Kubernetes has drivers for OpenStack meaning that when you do a volume claim, for example, then it will provide it will be provided by a Cinder volume. These, so Kubernetes and OpenStack play very well together. There's also the project called Magnum, which is Kubernetes clusters as a service where you just type a single OpenStack command and then it set up Kube for you, just a cluster. Uh, famously, the CERN in Geneva as well is, is uh, using Magnum a lot. I heard they have more than 300 Kubernetes clusters like that, which are just on demand. So by all means, do not think that uh, OpenStack becomes irrelevant because of Kube. I think that's kind of the opposite way. If you want to have a nice environment to run Kube, then OpenStack is, is very well made for it. between the two technologies together. Uh, just um, for OCI, I, I had to choose a configuration management software. I had to choose between uh, Ansible because there is the Ansible OpenStack project uh, maintained by a bunch of people in the community, OpenStack community. Then there was also the Puppet OpenStack uh, modules. And then I choose that because it was feature complete. Puppet OpenStack is a bunch of Puppet modules that, that can be reused to provision infrastructure. And to me, it has a lot more options and features than NC, at least at the time when I chose it, Ansible OpenStack didn't have. And the next question is, can multiple instances share the same GPU? 
So um, in OpenStack, the answer would be yes, you can. There is the possibility to use, uh, you know, these very, very expensive uh, GPUs from NVIDIA where you can uh, divide a GPU into slices. For example, one single GPU can be divided into 16 slices that you can assign to many flavors inside a compute node. So OpenStack can do it. Uh, OCI cannot use that feature yet, simply because uh, we don't need it at Infomaniac. So I don't have any of this type of GPU to play with, but like maybe one day I will implement it or somebody else will contribute, maybe it can happen. And uh, does it do uh, via VFIO? I believe that's what I've implemented, yes. And next question is, why are you using BGP for OpenStack? So when you have a lot of servers into, so, uh, let me just tell a uh, production story. So we have uh, one data center L, which is which has uh, maybe 16 racks. And we had a couple of switches that were having hardware issues. When they resetted, they just um, uh, resetted the whole ARP tree in the whole uh, uh, data center uh, row. So that's really bad for production because it takes a lot of time to uh, get ARP connectivity again. So that's the first thing. The second thing is ARP does a lot of broadcast traffic that you really want to avoid because the more server you have in one subnet, the more ARP traffic you have. And that's traffic for nothing that, that isn't helpful for connectivity, just annoying. So doing a full BGP uh, connectivity helps a lot. Scaling uh, your, your cluster, you can scale to uh, how many nodes you want. There's no, no limit to BGP, but there are limits to ARP for sure. And then there's one more question. Kubernetes can't be in testing stable repos in Debian. Were you aware and do you have ideas how to handle that? Would X3 for fast track be good solutions for this? Uh, so, in uh, in my company, there's a lot of people doing uh, Cube. I don't, so I'm I'm not the right person to ask right. uh, Kubernetes questions. All right. Uh, I wish I had time to it to do it, but you know, there's there's only 24 hours in a day. All right. And then there's uh, another question: Why is OpenStack cool? Oh, I like this one. Uh, so I've how would I start with it? Um, first of all, that's the biggest infrastructure infrastructure as a service solution that you find as free software. Uh, the other solutions that were starting a few uh, years ago are kind of uh, not getting traction. And uh, OpenStack has a lot of uh, cool projects it's completely free of vendor lock-in and it can work on any hardware. Uh, it can scale from one node to uh, hundreds of nodes. It's not uncommon to, um, to have up to 1,000 nodes per region, at which point you probably want to have multiple regions. And best of it, I believe, is its API. So both the API uh, for REST, like you would do with curl, or the Python SDK or the CLI, they are all very clean and very easy and nice to use. That's what I like the most about it. And when, if you compare that to other APIs, like from the proprietary clouds, I, it's my opinion that it's much better. And then we have one minute and one last question. How do you script firmware upgrades? Isn't that too vendor specific? So yes. Um, the thing that I've opened is the way to discover hardware and firmware versions. Uh, it just gives you a door so that you can write your own scripts. But like, of course, these firmwares are all, all uh, closed source, so I cannot ship them. So internally, we have a git for it. 
which makes the live image uh, very big, like a few gigs. And that's how we do firmware upgrades. I wish I could open it. And if you want this to be open, you may ask uh, the vendors like Dell, HP, and so on to open that. And that's all the this, this little I can do about it. Yeah. And that's the, all the time we have for questions. Thank you so much, Sigurd, for the talk and for answering all the questions. Thank you. Thank, thanks, everyone. <laughs>